into positions of hopelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no. Damn America. Ca-ca. I am Jake Flores. Alex Patak is here. Hey, welcome to the show. Anders Lee is here. Anders Lee here. And special guest, uh, author and friend of mine, P.E. Moskowitz. Welcome to the show. Hi, everyone. P.E. waved to the P.E. waved. You can't it. see it. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you can't hear waves over the. Those vibrations you hear in your earbuds, that was the wave. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel those vibes? Yeah. That's PE. <laughs> uh, first order of business, obviously, the um, most important story of the day, I guess, is uh, rest in power, comrade Larry King. Um, yeah, we're talking about Lawrence King of the uh, credit union scandal from um, Nebraska. No or the doing, Franklin Credit Union. No one's that doing, King. No one is getting this joke. No right, one. Knows. No one knows who that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's only one Larry King to the people on this podcast, <laughs> and that's one thousand year old <laughs> late night host. <laughs> yeah. um, Newsman. I don't even know what he did. He was just old and kept alive by television waves. <laughs> He was an interviewer, and I think we talked about this at one point. He was famous for, you know, some people would call this lazy. Uh, I would say it's, you know, just a testament to his his brilliance. Very off the cuff. He would not prepare for his interviews. He would let the guests tell him what they were about, you know, right. like it was a natural conversation, like you're just meeting somebody. Um, he a style we have adopted on this show <laughs> yeah. by not preparing for our interviews. <laughs> yeah, we do Larry King style podcasting. <laughs> yeah, the Larry King school. Well, but he was actually a coworker of mine, uh, technically, uh, because CNN. He was like too old to be on CNN, and I think I don't think he wanted to retire. They were just like, you can't do this anymore. <laughs> Please lie down. Yeah. <laughs> You were Stop just recording yourself. Yeah, you just accidentally referred to Sarah Palin as Angie Dickinson. Like you're, <laughs> this is you're over the hill, sir. And uh, RT took him in, as we do. You know, other uh, Rick um, Rick Sanchez, right? He was past his prime. People thought, but then he came to 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 pop a pooty, and we, you know, we made we we revealed his big uh, his stardom, his his talent, which never went away. Larry King, you, you're referring to yourself as Lawrence King, who we all know and love from that banking scandal. You've lost your mind. <laughs> <laughs> we live in a special kind of hell, don't we, where you get, like, too old <laughs> to, to, like, you know if you'll retire, you'll die, but there's nothing good you can do, so you just throw yourself back into the machine over and over again until your bones come out. <laughs> well, wait, wait, yeah. Be- P. I e. think right? every talk show should be over like 80 years old because I think those are the best kinds of interviews where they're just rambling on about nothing for two hours. Yeah. Right. Well, they ask the same questions Maybe. a few times in case you miss stuff. It's good. <laughs> what you One were just talking is- about uh, when he interviewed Slipknot. What was I vaguely remember this? What happened? Oh, they just he just had no clue what kind of music they made. It was Corey Taylor of Slipknot. But not rock on. Um, and uh, it was just like, so what kind of music do you guys make? Is it is it hard? Is it a uh, rock and roll? Like, you know, do you feel angry when you're making your music? And Corey Taylor was just like in a stunned silence, being like, "Who the fuck are you?" <laughs> I am. That's right, Larry King. We have a man who only hits a trash can with a bat. <laughs> I, well, I remember him like coming away from that interview with like like he had a good time because he would tweet at Corey Taylor and just like on Corey Taylor's birthday he'd be like Happy birthday oh Corey Taylor Are you wearing your mask today? <laughs> <laughs> 
this is she, one issue where we cannot push our fingers into our eyes. <laughs> I uh, I remember reading a book about when I was 16. I, I w- went to my local library and I checked out all the books about the 1996 presidential election. And one was sort of focused on the media. And they had a story about Lori, Larry King. Lori King. Uh, and they were talking about how he got his start, which is in Brooklyn as a kid, he would just like stand on the street corner and shout the news. Like he was a town crier, but in like the thirties, like but just that after that was done. a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then he just like kept, kept on talking and talking and talking. And that's what his skill was. He could just not shut up. And, uh, and he apparently, he I would, can't believe that job's gone out of fashion. You don't have just newsboys on the corner being like, J.K. Rowling, turf, <laughs> active in the media circle. This is actually where the phrase go off king originates. It's in the yeah. dictionary. People Lena would... Dunham, not sorry. She molested her sister. <laughs> X-tree. Yeah. There you go. A tri-corner hat on and a bell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, you dropped this, king. Uh <laughs> It's your, you're a legend. I don't know. Um, it's your, your the, own head, the Seinfeld right? cancel uh, clip. Have you guys seen that? You've, everybody seen that? <laughs> what? Yeah. What is Where it? Where he um, is talking to Seinfeld, Jerry Seinfeld, and he's like, "Well, in uh, 1998, Seinfeld got canceled," and Jerry is like, "What? We weren't canceled? Canceled? Do I need my resume out here? Canceled?" And he just starts like freaking out at this gentle old man who's like, "Sorry, I don't like I I don't prepare. What do you want from me?" <laughs> was it not? It just ended organically. Yeah, yeah it was I a felt... hit show. It was like the most popular show of of the time. It was one of the I longest that. running TV shows. It was like its whole thing. He... Good. Time Time only has eight seasons. It's not the longest running TV show. No. But I just thought it, I assumed it was canceled. At the time, it was very known for being long running. I think maybe I'm maybe I'm talking about my ass. Hey, I don't want to be accused of being intolerant towards Seinfeld. That's not who <laughs> for, I am. That's for a not 90s, who we are. For a '90s sitcom, it was very very mature in, in terms of how long it lasted. That's true. It was a beautiful older woman of yeah. the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, believe it or not, the entire episode is not about Larry King and or Seinfeld. Or is it? <laughs> I mean, in a way, in a way. Um, yeah. I'll tell you You know what? Here. He was big on free speech. There you go. I wanted to talk <laughs> about free speech. But Andrew's we'll... throwing a cue card away <laughs> after that. <laughs> I'll kind of circle back to this in a minute. Here, you might be asking yourself, why? Why talk about free speech right now? Um, let's set the stage. Well, we we should mention that an inauguration has happened. Um, a 78-year-old man has uh, smashed through the glass ceiling uh, <laughs> that they keep 78-year-old yeah. man out of the White House with. Right. Um, he's the first 78-year-old man. He's the oldest president we've ever had. Joe Biden has been inaugurated. It happened a few days ago. I uh, unfortunately share a birthday with that event, so uh, that was weird. It was, it was uh, it definitely felt like he was stealing the stage from me. Um, so happy birthday, though. Thank you. Um, if it was up to me, Jake, you you would be the president. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Jake. Thank you. I'm gonna get every four years. I'm gonna get, or every. Four to eight years, I'm going to get a new president for my birthday. It's really weird. I was really hoping to be Bernie this time. It yeah. was um, it was really awesome four years ago when Trump was inaugurated because everyone at, like at the bar was just like bartender, kill me, like <laughs> just <laughs> pounding alcohol. So I just pretended like it was for me, and you know, like the reason everyone was so rowdy. Ugh, this, was... this is what happens on your birthday when you ask your mother for a Bernie Sanders and she goes out and gets you a different old white man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, definitely like, uh, what is it? It's like a Sega Dreamcast or something. No, Dreamcast was cool. I don't know. So <laughs> we'll figure that out later. Super Nintendo instead of 64. How about... No, because those are like different things on the same 
Pretty and you what actually if you got one of those ones, ones you put on one, your head. Actually. It's like a whole helmet, and they're like, "Hey, that's a Dreamcast. It's on your head." <laughs> yeah, like a virtual boy. I remember there was like a yard sale in my neighborhood when I was a kid, and and these old ladies are like, "We have an Xbox in here," and it was a Dreamcast. So, I guess that fits. Owned. Yeah. Dead platform. Damn. Um. Yeah. So I don't know what there is to say about uh. Biden's inauguration that we haven't really covered since the fact that he was elected. You know, obviously everyone listens to this show is probably on a similar page about it. Um, Thrilled. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're going uh, into into a, a you know the, the road diverged into oh either Trump and that being insane and uh, terrifying or this which is really grating in another way which is that liberals are just like it's racism is over and uh now we can finally stop talking about politics and uh you know ultimately we're probably just shuffling somewhat backwards into the same conditions that created like a trump presidency to begin with right so in four years who fucking knows some kind of new trump we'll see that's my two cents right uh (laughs) oh no i've become possessed with the spirit of larry king (laughs) <laughs> hashtag king's thing so let's look materially at where we're at i've been thinking about this a lot because i've been reading this uh historian this marxist historian named eric hobsbawm that i think i've mentioned on the show a few times and you know really using the quarantine to kind of go through just the groundwork of uh 18th, 19th, and 20th century history to try to understand all of, uh, you know, historical materialism and all that sort of shit. The Age of Revolution, great book, um, sort of describes something that I thought was kind of interesting in the Industrial Revolution in that era, um, being a dual revolution with, like, the French Revolution and how that led us to, I don't know, the modern world, right? Um, and in it, there's this passage. I'm going to pause real quick while I find the book. I actually wanted to read it right out of the book. <coughs> okay, here's a paragraph I wanted to read. It um, goes like this. In brief, this is about the French Revolution, by the way. In brief, the main shape of... Well, it's about the French Revolution and the subsequent revolutions and the pattern that society has sort of taken since then. Right? Yeah, the lib shit, for sure. In brief, the main shape of French and all subsequent bourgeois revolutionary politics were by now clearly visible. This dramatic dialectical dance was to dominate the future generations. Time and time again, we shall see moderate middle-class reformers mobilizing the masses against die-hard resistance or counter-revolution. We shall see the masses push, uh, pushing beyond the moderates' aims to their own social revolutions. And the moderates, in turn, splitting into a conservative group, henceforth making a common cause with the reactionaries and a left-wing group determined to pursue the rest of the as-yet unachieved moderate aims with the help of the masses, even at the risk of losing control over them. And so on, through repetitions and variations of this pattern of resistance, mass mobilization, shift to the left, splitting amongst moderates, and shift to the right, until either the bulk of the middle class passed into the henceforth conservative camp or was defeated by social revolution. In most subsequent bourgeois revolutions, the moderate liberals were to pull back or transfer into the conservative camp at a very early stage. Indeed, in the 19th century, we increasingly find, most notably in Germany, that they became unwilling to begin revolution at all for fear of its incalculable consequences, preferring a compromise with the king and aristocracy. The peculiarity of the French Revolution is that One section of the liberal middle class was prepared to remain revolutionary up to and indeed beyond the brink of anti-bourgeois revolution. These were the Jacobins, whose name came to stand for radical revolution everywhere. Um, And also a magazine. So, I don't know, I was reading that the other day, and it kind of was one of those things where I, like my eyes got huge and I put the book down and I stared out a window and I was like, fuck (laughs) because I thought that, um, you know, reading this old fucking text somehow, uh, really wrap up, sum up exactly what it feels like we're 
stuck in and will permanently be stuck in. Um, you know, it's very ominous, I guess. You know, it very much feels like we probably missed our any shot we had for our our time with, uh, you know, that whole Bernie Sanders campaign and shit. And uh, now we're stuck in this thing that Hobbs Obama was describing that, you know, A, is, is sort of like a, a big, broad, um, you know, social problem with with the middle class being this duplicitous thing that is constantly going to swing reactionary, only very disingenuously ally with uh, the left and um, also this continually like rising pressure of uh, authoritarian surveillance that keeps really any revolutionary action from happening to begin with. That seems to be getting like worse and worse and worse, right? Um, and I guess I was just thinking about all this and I was just like, wow, what the fuck is like even possible? What's going to happen, you know? And it occurred to me where I guess all of those factors kind of pushing together onto this uh, precarious situation we're in that doesn't really seem to have any way of expressing itself other than, you know, the poor getting poorer and all this neoliberal shit continuing to happen and uh, Kamala having a lightsaber and stuff like that instead of us getting our $2,000, you know. <laughs> um Let's give everyone a lightsaber. That'd be fine. I, you bet you could pawn it for yeah, at least a grand. A lot. Um, but be, then we're just using the lightsabers as money. Like, how useful is that, really? Why not just give out money at that point? I mean, I mean, alternative currency. Let's do it. Yeah, or you could mug somebody with the lightsaber. That'd True. Be pretty cool. But they also I just don't have know, order, like, what whatever. practical use the lightsaber has. Government like, should give an entire fifteen. I'm sorry, said again. You might as well give them all an AR-15. Yeah. Oh, there you go. An AR-15, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm. This passage sort of uh, reminded me of something I've been thinking about with like how liberals will say, like, "Hey, I want a lot of the thing, same things you want. I'm just, I don't support uh, revolution or overthrow or rioting or anything." And it's like they do. You do. I can. We can point to. Parts of history where you would be okay with that if it was going in a bourgeois liberal direction. You're, what you don't want is a is a left wing revolution. You don't want to work well, in a left revolution. Is it the direction, or is it that those other revolutions happened before they were alive, and so it didn't get in the way of your Garfield Sunday night reading hour? <laughs> well, that's part of it too. Other but beloved institutions. That's part of it too. But all the people that they sort of you know revere, the founding fathers and people like that, they were all revolutionary right there you know the the old adage one man's uh one person's freedom fighter is the other is another person's terrorist you know i think that it's it, that's just sort of a hypocritical thing like it's we all um pick and choose what moments we think are ripe for revolutionary change and and what what aren't and what, what we think an appropriate use of force or violence is and and when it's not appropriate, right? That's that liberals are not immune to that. So I think, yeah, just breaking that sort of uh, misconception that they have that they're sort of above revolutionary violence in all in all uh, moments, I think is at least a good place to start. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like this thing where it goes to this idea that like who has the monopoly on the definition of violence, right? right. Like the state does essentially yes. and, and liberals are okay with that that's the difference between liberals and, and leftists or whatever it's like or one of the main differences is they don't see what the state does as violent or they think that violence is justified but right when I, when anyone else uses violence whether it's the far right or the far left then that, that's not okay because it's breaking their their notion that only one powerful entity should have the monopoly on violence yeah, exactly. And that's their definition, right? That's the UN's definition is the state has the monopoly of violence. They just don't like to think about that. Okay. Yeah, that's a Larry King once said to the Beatles, <laughs> why does your jazz have to be so loud? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, kind of identifying that like false dialectic or whatever is actually a really good place to start here, because uh, that's really what's at play when we talk about 
free speech a lot of the time. Um, you'll notice that there are there, there's this thing where, and we're gonna get into this as I you know we go through the book here, but there's this, this thing where um, uh, it's it's like I'm really having a hard time putting it into words. But okay, so you remember the Capitol riot and where people were like saying, "Oh, you you agree with uh, riots when uh, Black Lives Matter does it, but not when these people do it." And you go, "Yeah, that's not the issue. It's this third thing. It's right. it's who has the power in society to begin yeah. with. How does that affect whether or not you are rioting and things like that?" Um, so it's it's a. There's also the very direct angle of it of just like why are we having a riot? Right. That's the other thing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, maybe it's not the question is not whether rioting is good or bad, or I know the questioning is not yeah whether rioting it's good or bad. It's when you riot for good things it's good, and when you riot for bad things it's right. bad. Right. Bad. Um, yeah. I mean, it goes to the yeah again. It's like this kind of like fake universality that like liberals see the world through like free speech good protests good unless it's x y and z kind of protest but they don't really think that they just think protest should be protected and it's like yeah rioting rioting's bad if it's from the left or the right but it's okay in in these other contexts yeah i mean i think big overarching idea here is just framing is really a right. tricky thing I, um you know another thing i've been thinking about a lot with liberals and conservatives just because uh there's you know everyone's so annoying right now given that politics is what's on tv for them is um this is like a really basic observation but i guess because it's so basic i can't stop thinking about it the th shit that we do with republicans and democrats running against each other for president it's good cop bad cop it's the same thing where you frame it as a choice between two things that are like wait a minute these are both the same guy like they're working for the same class in the case of uh our political parties and then when when you're in jail and they you know they have two cops coming at you it's like no they're both cops like they're sharing sharing information you know um it's, it's hard not to think about that right now because joe biden keeps going on tv and being like i'm friends with the republicans <laughs> we're on the same team <laughs> what it kamal is a cop right so right yeah, yeah. um it's so yeah it's almost like it's them against you is that possible <laughs> Yeah, but in order to Weird. understand that, you have to pull back, and it's like really hard to pull back. Once you get people uh, framed in an argument, you've won the entire fucking thing because you've limited where, you know, where, where the the bounds of the fucking argument are. Anyways, all of this is, is to say, um, I guess with all of this happening, and then with the other thing that happened, uh, you know, last month at the end of the month, or was it the beginning of the year? I can't remember. Trump getting kicked off. Twitter and that riling up Republicans and shit into their favorite thing, which is calling everything Orwellian. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's <laughs> suddenly sort of crying that we are in 1984 and that free speech, the sacred thing that they supposedly care about so much is being threatened. Um, you know, that discourse always really fucking annoys me as a, you know, comedian the one thing that you could say our our fucking job that we do or our thing that we do uh really is relevant to politically is this concept of free speech it's a flag a lot of comedians wave um i do like that when you bomb you're not arrested yeah <laughs> that's something that's been very important to me in my politics in the last 10 years or however long <laughs> yeah it's kind of like you actually aren't being oppressed when you do bad slava open mics but uh jury's still out on that one <laughs> it feels like you are i understand the confusion but you're doing it to yourself <laughs> so all of this got me thinking about free speech and i took the time uh to go back and read P.E.'s book, which is called The Case of Free Speech, rather reread. Um, I read it, I kind of sped read it when it came out, but I didn't remember some stuff, and I remember I wanted to go back over a couple key historical points from the book, um, just to sort of like, uh, what do you call it, brush up on them, um, because I think this book, you make a really great point in it that is relevant to uh, not just the you know the the is the trump getting banned discourse the it, are we literally in animal farm or whatever stuff but also the material stuff that i was describing because free speech as we'll discover is actually you know in history a very material concept and not this weird idealist voltaire fucking thing that uh it sort of presents itself as 
nowadays. So, P.E., can you tell me a little bit about uh, your book, why you wrote it, um, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> when did I start thinking about writing it? Probably like 2015. And it seems like we just always go in these cycles about free speech and cancel culture and who's being banned and deplatforming and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I think when I started writing it, it was just at like an inflection point, especially with college campus stuff where everyone was angry at, at college students for protesting Milo Yiannopoulos and Charles Murray. I mean, all this stuff now feels like ancient fucking history. Like no one cares about those people anymore, you know, hit because the platforming worked of them. But um, uh, like, so just looking at that from a more materialist angle, because I felt like everything I was seeing on the internet and in news articles and at the op-ed pages of every newspaper was like, oh, we all might disagree, but at least we have these like universal values. And so I wanted to question like, do we have these universal values? Where did those supposed universal values come from? And what's the like actual material history of them? Like who's living and dying, who's being imprisoned based on these supposedly universal values. So I basically just wanted to like take something that was really annoying me and go deeper with it and try to figure out like where this, uh, this concept of free speech that we have uh, came from. And like, it's obviously not surprising, but like everything else, it's like goes back to this like conservative capture of our culture that started in, in really the 1970s. Uh, and like all the usual suspects, like the Koch brothers, like it's not a conspiracy theory because it's true. Like they sat down and hatched a plan to make free speech the kind of method through which they pushed through their far right agenda. And now we're all living with the consequence of that 50 years later. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So the idea of free speech is this, you know, universal ethereal thing. I mean, it's often today presented as the, the, the one ar argument you sort of hear beaten to death over and over and over again is, is like, um, you know, if, if, uh, if we censor somebody we don't like, well, the, the tables are going to be turned tomorrow and they're going to censor us on the left with that same law that we create or something like that. Right. Um, that's always sort of banded about by the people you can tell are being very disingenuous or have some sort of other motive. <laughs> and it's very infuriating. So to me, um, yeah, hearing people talk like that also makes me me go wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute this seems like a false premise this seems like this is kind of predicated on bullshit so mm -hmm. probably a good idea to go back in time and look at this thing that everyone's referring to and ask a question it, wait is this actually even a thing that you're referring to so let's start with the first amendment right because that's the thing that that all the american flag guys refer to and you know right. take you know, Alex Jones photos of themselves with the fucking constitution and shit. Um, so <laughs> the first amendment doesn't really have that much in it. It's, it doesn't really explain any of this shit that it's supposedly being applied to today and really wasn't evoked for much of American history in this way at all. Um, it seems retroactive that we've sort of engineered the first amendment to be about, you know, literally speech. Right. Um, right. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's been used as it's always been a form of propaganda and I don't mean propaganda in a bad way because like good people use propaganda too. Um, but it's, it's been, it's never actually had a, a concrete definition. I mean, you know, the most obvious hypocrisy to point out is that when the first amendment was passed, like slavery was still legal. So obviously those people did not have free speech. People who, you know, weren't men couldn't vote. So those people didn't have free speech. It was never actually about universal free speech. It was always a form of propaganda. But over the years, I mean, in the early 1920s, unions used the first amendment as, for their own propaganda to say like, the right to free speech means the right to kind of like live a life in which you're free to express yourself. And that means having higher wages, that means not being forced to work in a factory for your entire life. Um, so they had a much more materialist view of free speech and use the First Amendment as as their kind of like advertisement for what the country should be. So the, the idea that it's always meant one thing is, is ridiculous. 
And I think, unfortunately, what's happened is that we're stuck with this, again, purposeful definition that's been like craft, crafted for us for the last 50 years by the far right and all their political allies. Um, so like, and, and I think the thing that pisses me off about that is like, obviously, leftists, people on the right, whatever, they're all going to fight over these definitions. But the thing that pisses me off is liberals and a lot of leftists um, from anarchists, communists, everyone has kind of taken for their word this very stupid <laughs> vacuous immaterial definition of free speech that actually means nothing at all <laughs> and so like e many people who i respect and think are really smart when it comes to free speech they're just like oh yeah that's good and everyone should have it and they don't actually know what they're talking about or they just kind of take take for granted that it's a, a, a real thing that we all can agree on um and that's that's not an accident that's that's based on this history of how it's been defined by the right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, another, this is going to be another fairly obvious point, but it begs repeating, I think, or it bears repeating, uh, you know, the, the American revolution is this like kind of liberal bourgeois revolution. And um, the, the projection we do on, do on it backwards in terms of being like the origin of, you know, our specific brand in this country's like, you know, scientific philosophy is completely ahistorical um you know the founding fathers are syphilitic fucking losers they had like you know slave teeth in their heads there's all this shit they don't teach you in history class they're insane i've been reading slave teeth george washington you know they say he had wooden teeth he had slave teeth yeah. <laughs> he had dead slaves teeth put what? into his fucking slave mouth. was made out of wood in all fairness. Oh, yeah, sure. He had Pinocchio's teeth in his <laughs> mouth. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hilarious if you actually kind of read back on it now. All the information's there, but it's just like, you know, nobody wants to read about the fucking American what Revolution. The fuck? Yeah, I mean, well, how would you tell a kindergarten class that those are like <laughs> dead people's teeth? And but, then be like, now we're celebrating his tree story. The, the well, teeth are not the point. The point I'm getting at, though, yeah. is <laughs> that's just the window dressing to the point. I just think it's really funny that they're, you know, it's, it's fucking insane people living in the woods. So, um, here's, for example, one thing that I think might paint a picture, the Declaration of Independence, I was reading recently, they had to do like, they had to edit it with like 30 people, because the first draft was completely insane, and Thomas Jefferson, who we, you know, deify as this like genius of individual liberty, he wrote, for example, in the first draft of the Declaration of Independence that uh, slavery was just King George's idea. And uh, we wouldn't have it if it wasn't for the British fucking crown. And that's all. That's why we're doing this revolution in which he didn't get rid of his slaves. So, like, what is he even trying to say? Right. Um, this whole thing is much wilder and much less sacred than we give it credit for. But we live in, you know, America and we're indoctrinated with the stuff in school. So most important byproduct of this is this idealist version of free speech that even fucking Noam Chomsky takes for gospel sometimes. And you're like, well, what the, f how, why, you know? Um, but it really gets in your head. And I think a good way to counter that, yeah, is to look at the materialist version of free speech that comes uh, maybe into like, you know, into action, into re uh, something we can observe a little bit later on in the labor movement in the 1920s. So, you know, everybody always refers to the ACLU on these issues because the ACLU is supposedly this institution that is around to, you know, to protect this sacred thing, right? But as PE points out in their book here, um, the ACLU used, used to be the NCLB, the uh, fuck, I wrote it down somewhere, the uh, National they rated Movies. Uh -huh. <laughs> the National Civil Liberties Bureau, which is founded in 1917. And existed to protect workers who struck against their bosses and even protected some workers who like dynamited their bosses headquarters and shit like that. Like, they did not nice. protect the boss in situations like this. It was a big, right. um, you know, and they definitely weren't protecting like far right figures as in some kind of like universalist, like everyone deserves the same representation. Right. This is because uh, they're the original theory of this organization of free speech was sort of two pronged. It was, uh, one, the goal was to agitate against the bosses because that is, you know, that's a free speech goal in and of itself 
because we understand that there's a power imbalance between workers and bosses. So, uh, you know, to try to alleviate that is actually to try that, you know, that is to work towards a, a for a positivist, um, free speech goal, which is you having equal power with other people in society, right, not just exactly. the equal technically right to say whatever you want. And uh, the second thing, which I thought was really interesting, was that another one of their goals that didn't seem to work was to delegitimize the Supreme Court by just taking case and case and case to the Supreme Court and eventually showing people, look, you notice how every time we go against the Supreme Court, they side with the boss and never with the worker. Mm -hmm. Um, I thought that was an interesting goal, but I do understand how it didn't work because <laughs> no one yeah. clearly gave a shit. Yeah, I can't believe calling the Supreme Court hypocrites over and over again didn't end the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they were a much more radical organization in the early 1920s and run mostly by communists and you know anti-war people. Um, and and super pro labor people, yeah. That that dynamiting incident you refer to is when I think it was two brothers uh, blew up the L.A. Times building because the L.A. Times was so anti-union. Um, and uh, the head of the ACLU at the time represented them in court and was like, "Well, you know, we probably shouldn't be bombing people, but at the same time, they kind of deserved it." Like that was their argument. Like. This is the this is the level of suppression that workers are facing that they would resort to bombing somewhere because uh, they're so fucking pissed about how they're being treated. And so for the for the ACLU, which we now think of as this like mealy mouth liberal organization, to be like in support of you know bombers <laughs> is a uh, it's a very different organization. And then unfortunately, there's you know, between the Red Scare that happened, you know, from the early 20s onward, um, they kind of purged themselves of all the communists and materialists and ended up with this much more abstract view of free speech that we have today. Right. And not protecting uh, people bombing in comedy either. Um, <laughs> if we could just zero in on, on something for a second like this. Uh, so we know how people use the term free speech now, generally. Uh, and we were starting to hear about, you know, the early 20th century. Um, but if we could just go back and clarify, what was the founding fathers? What were they talking about when they um, used the term free speech? Because I, I assume it's probably a different thing from from both of those. I don't think they really had a clear definition of what it was either. Um, I mean, I think that, again, it was kind of just this abstract goal. I think they did want to protect the idea of some kind of free press. You know, I wasn't in the room with them, obviously. Sure. Um, but uh, I think that it was, to give them the benefit of the doubt, I do think it was an ideal they were going for, but it obviously had all these built-in, you know, hypocrisies from the outset, like in terms of who could vote, who could right. live freely and all of that. But it, I, like as soon as soon as soon as the amendments were passed, like, governments were arresting people for protesting things they were suing newspapers that went against the federal government they you know like it it wasn't like the the first amendment ever protected anyone it was like the same people who wrote it like 10 days later were like and also this newspaper proprietor should be in jail for saying that you know i'm a bad politician or whatever right it's, it kind of sounds like it was to protect the the bourgeoisie right that that was to make sure the state does not supersede us that the bourgeoisie is in control of society and that the, the state doesn't somehow um get above us and censor us but as far as everybody else um uh, it's all fair game to them yeah i mean i think it's that's the conflict that made them leave england right so they wanted yeah. to be the emergent bourgeois class and monarchy and they were just like you are not related to the duchess of western <laughs> bay and they burn you alive and that fucking sucks yeah i mean it's yeah. it's a uh... It's classical liberalism, you know? I mean, looking at it at, at its origin point makes the contradictions a lot more stark, I think. And that, I think, helps you understand that we're still living in them, even if they've sort of been expanded. Because what f free speech or all, most, you know, all of the rights that are being sort of uh, lauded and heralded in the origin of this country mean is uh, freedom for property owners, 
And at the right. time, that is what, like 6% of uh, the population or something, because you have to be white and male and own property and all this stuff. So that excludes all these other people. And we sort of live in the this myth, I think, in the in the modern world that that then was expanded to include everyone else. But I think by definition, these, uh, you know, these forms of Liberty can only be, um, weighted towards the, the top. They can only sort of like move everything, move all the freedom and Liberty and things like that materially towards people that own a lot of property. And so we still live in this contradiction where, even if, you know, me and Charles Koch can, is he the dead one? Someone who's alive, uh, me and fucking Jeff Bezos or whatever, both technically can say whatever we want. We're not equally free because he can do whatever he wants. And I can't, you know? Right. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I mean, I think even if you're, you're taking a really like nice view of, of these values, like let's pretend that the constitution was like, a good thing and that all these founding fathers had had you know their hearts in the right places they just kind of missed a huge component of freedom which is that it doesn't exist if you can't afford it right like so and this goes back to this idea of like positivist versus negativist uh forms of liberty and freedom and speech is you know on paper technically we all have the same right to strive for wealth or for a new home or whatever and we all have the same right to speak but like i as someone who is you know like i'm obviously not making tons of money because i'm an author but uh like who has some money and who has the ability to speak and be published places i have more freedom of speech than someone who's working 70 hours a week to get by and like doesn't have a platform at all and i have you know 10,000 times less free speech than someone who can like literally buy off a politician. Right. So even if, even if in this negative sense, we have all, all the same rights, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It's, you know, I, I called the book, the case against free speech, not because I hate free speech, but because I don't think it exists. Right. We, we just don't have it. I have less than billionaires and many people have less than me and so unless we actually want to equalize society materially we're all going to have different amounts of freedom to speak to live and live happy lives and all of that i mean that the very idea of freedom is just broken at the outset by the material inequality of this country yeah i mean this is you know this is basic uh materialism i mean you look at the you know what's going on in setting up a bourgeois liberal society it both it both births these new forms of freedom but it births them in these imperfect ways where they only really apply to uh you know to to, to a certain amount of people and then when we do expand them to everyone they they uh wait in a they they, they they heavily like lean in one direction which is upward um and we are going to live in the process of everyone being unequal because everything is weighted towards people with property and that continually stratifies things forever until we somehow, you know, get out of the situation, which is goes back to that Hobbs bomb stuff I was talking about, that continual pressure uh, for revolt from, you know, the working class sort of uh, attempting to work towards revolution, although we might be living in a fucking time and place where that isn't going to happen right now so we're just going to experience the contradictions instead but because everything's are so because the contradictions are so stark right now i think that like looking at this free speech disparity right now should be very obvious you know it should be like a, a lot uh easier to illustrate since there is just a great wealth disparity right now it's only getting worse how this actually right. doesn't really like work universally the way that we were imagining it was working towards from the fucking constitution forward. Right. And like any, any society is built with limitations of, of free speech, no matter what, whether it's a communist society or a capitalist society or whatever, like in our society, even if you think everyone should have free speech, we've already put vast limits on it through private property, right? I can't walk into someone's house and start yammering on about something and they, they could shoot me because I'm on their property, right? So that's a limitation to my free speech because- we That's actually how Larry King died. 
reasons. So, <laughs> but we value private property over speech. So we all take that that limitation for granted. So when we talk about who should have free speech or who has more free speech or we should all have free speech, we already are like starting from like nine tenths of our speech not ever being free, and then we're all fighting for the crumbs over what's left. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's uh, just to stand off. <laughs> I just to put a cap on this also this uh this liberalism thing at the beginning of this conversation um I want to talk about something else that is relevant to uh this Hobbsbaum quote that I was talking about which is um the tendency of the rate of profit to fall right so you know the the American idealist implication of our like democracy and freedom sort of implies that yeah that this thing although it started off for slave owners and for you know these jeffersonian individuals setting out to set up the country that that would expand and that when that expands freedom expands right so jefferson's idea was just that everyone becomes the man on the farm literally every person in society eventually owns slaves how does that work what if you are the slave you know um so (laughs) this this implication that uh, that freedom sort of expands like that, um, it implies that the economic aspect of the freedom would go with it, and that it would expand as well, and that like somehow everyone becomes in the bourgeois class eventually. And this fundamentally doesn't work out, I think, if you understand the way you know the economy works, because what was happening around this time in um, both in this country and in Europe was while things were industrializing, you saw that when an industry blew up, um, you would sort of uh, immediately experience massive profits and then invest in the industry. And as you uh, continue to invest in the industry, let's say you make like trains, for example, um, you experience profits, right? But eventually, naturally, there's a tendency for your profit rate to fall. And so when that happens... If you're in America, you have a frontier. And so the way you supplement your l- lowering profits is to just make more transactions happen, invest more, just make more business. So instead, you make $10 on every transaction, great. It lowers to nine, eight, seven. Well, you're going to make up the amount of money that you're losing by just doing more business, right? But what happened in Britain and England where, you know, the birth of all this like disparity, all these Dickensian novels are written and stuff like that is there's nowhere to expand. So that extra sort of pressure lands on the workers, right? And that's how you get all of this bullshit that we talk about on this podcast, right? Um, But that natural uh, tendency is in direct opposition with this idea that expanding businesses and and shit like that leads as jefferson would argue to just everyone getting richer doesn't make any sense can't work that way right right it's all a a scam (laughs) (laughs) and i think that's why people cling so hard to like these these abstract ideals of democracy and freedom of speech and whatever is because without them then you're left with nothing like if you you know if i talk to your average liberal if i talk to my parents, no disrespect if they're, if they listen to this, but like they (laughs) will, uh, you know, they'll be like, Oh, well at least, you know, like, yeah, the U S is like really fucked up, but like, at least we have like the right to say things or like, at least we have the, we're not brainwashed by, you know, propaganda or whatever. And it's like, one, that's not true, but two, it's, it's like, we were clinging on to these abstract values because if you take those away, and realize that they're totally fake, then you're left with the realization that we have fucking nothing, that we are just all, you know, becoming progressively poorer and progressively more exploited mm-hmm. and that the world fucking sucks. So so I think they work, they're a really effective form of propaganda because they allow people to ignore all these material realities in favor of these abstract ones that um, we can like idealize in our heads. Yeah, I mean, you uh, really, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to, to make sure to mention one particular point um, about which I believe PE mentions in their book, uh, which is this this old, and this goes back to the the issue of like free speech is not unlimited, even you know it's it's never been unlimited, uh, and that's the 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 old phrase "fire in a crowded theater," yeah, uh, which is a lot of people repeat without quite knowing the background behind that. Can you provide us with the 
context originally for that that turn of phrase. Right. I think it's really funny because pe- everyone's kind of conceptualization of free speech is, oh, well, you can say whatever you want as long as it doesn't cause like mass panic or mass chaos, yeah. i.e. don't shout fire in a crowded theater. But what Which that con- I, I never, I never like that phrase because what if there is an actual fire, you know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, like that dog sitting in the house on fire meme, like that's all yeah. of right now. <laughs> so we should be shouting fire. Um, no, but like, it came from a court case where it was about someone being arrested for handing out literature against the U.S. entering World War One, right? Um, so it wasn't it wasn't about fire in a crowded theater or lack of fire in a crowded theater. It was about the suppression of protest and dissent against uh, imperialism, and the the judge's reasoning was, oh well, in wartime when the U.S. needs a united front you can't cause chaos by quote unquote shouting fire in a crowded theater or by being against the war. And so everyone's idea of free speech that like, we all have this measured take on it because we believe in this fire in a crowded theater shit is actually about like, you know, jailing leftists. (laughs) Yeah. It's bullshit lawyer stuff. It's like if the entire uh, backbone of everyone's ideology of this country was based on like Johnny Cochran shit or something like (laughs) made up bullshit. He was just trying to win a court case with, um, right. Was that when they threw Eugene Debs in jail, or is that just the same era? I think I always get that wrong. I think that was just the same era. I don't think it was Debs. I might be wrong, but I don't think it was Debs in that case specifically. Well, Debs was thrown in jail for uh, for right. you know sedition, quote unquote, for De- running for president, protesting right. the you know for ruining a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how all of this materialist free speech action went away, right? So yeah, you do have the era where it suddenly is uh it's punishable by imprisonment to dissent from, you know, the national war effort. Uh the war effort, the fucking World War 1. Um not a good war. No, no reason for us to be in it, right? Um then you also had the Palmer raids where we threw Emma Goldman on a fucking boat. Um, you know, the FBI is sort of starting to ramp up and get worked up into this anti-communist organization. And the, what you have then is organizations that are actually left and for the working class either live, you know, like the AFL-CIO, but in this form that's completely... Uh, I'm trying not to use the word cucked right now. I don't know. Um, Neutered. (laughs) Yeah, totally neutered, where nowadays they've endorsed Hillary Clinton and shit like that. Or people that did sort of maintain their integrity either were entirely axed or uh, pressured or subdued into, you know, dissolution. Or you have, like, the IWW, who's you know still around, but it's not really what it was around the, you know, the turn of the century back then. Um, In this process... The ACLU loses its sort of material vision, and it survives the process of America's uh, extermination of communists and things like that, and deportation of communists and disorganization by switching its focus to like individual liberties. Right. civil liberties and then it starts getting into the stuff that you know about the aclu where it's like an organization that's going to defend someone who doesn't say the pledge of allegiance or something very like you know intangible or something like that um and this all sort of leads through mccarthyism um and into i guess can we talk a little bit about i might be brushing past some things but um the turn that the ACLU takes where it starts representing Nazis, particularly in the instance of this case in Skokie. Yeah. Yeah. So um, starting in the 1920s is, is when everything starts changing. And there's this really big divide, not only in the ACLU, but in in unions and in like movements in general where, you know, people for, for good reason are scared that if they say they're communists or if they really like, you know, like do what, what's normal in France, for example, today used to be normal in, in the United States, like where people would just like start fires and riots because, you know, bosses were overworking them or whatever. Um, and then there was, you know, this massive oppression campaign really starting in the mid uh, 1910s going all the way 
till today, but like really ramping up in the 40s and 50s through uh, through McCarthyism and, and COINTELPRO, where you know people were actually being arrested just for being communists. So so these organizations had to make these choices, like do we do we keep keep on representing actual radicals and like have this very materialist vision where there's no such thing as free speech without the economic liberation of the working class, which is, you know, what the U the ACLU was based around um, until the 1920s, uh, or do we kind of water ourselves down and turn into these more pal palatable organizations that can get money from liberal donors essentially. And obviously the ACLU did the latter and, and the, the biggest inflection point, in that was, I mean, Skokie is pretty well known, but even before that, they literally like purged out all the communists from the ACLU um, in the 40s, I believe. So, but then Skokie in, uh, in the 70s, you know, this small uh, suburb in, outside of Chicago, which was filled with um, Jewish immigrants who came after the Holocaust, uh, this little Nazi organization decided to hold a rally there um uh because they basically wanted to antagonize all the jews that lived in skokie and there were lots of groups that were like literally bringing guns ready to do battle with the nazis um both like Jew like anti-fascists and then like jewish fas fascists um uh what's that name of that group the ant uh i forget what it's the called, jdl but... or something like that JDL, right. The Jewish Defense League. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I wish I met some of their members and they're kind of crazy, but uh, they basically their thing was like, if we see a Nazi, we'll curb stomp them. So props to them for that, at least. But they also, they're like literally Jewish supremacists. They think Jews should like run the earth and are smarter than everyone or whatever. Um, which has to change that Beyonce song about girls to be about <laughs> Jews. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's their anthem, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it just sounds hateful to people who aren't in on it. It's a double-edged sword. Right, right, yeah. I mean, and it's like su they're super, like, anti-Palestinian and all that. Who runs the fucking world, Jews? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but long story short, the ACLU supported the ability of the Nazis to march in Skokie on the grounds of freedom of speech. And they lost like half their members over that decision. And that was the huge turning point where the ACLU went from, we're going to defend this like class-based union-based uh, vision of freedom where there is no freedom without economic liberation to we're gonna defend this abstract notion of freedom where there is no freedom unless everyone has a theoretical right to speak, even if they're Nazis antagonizing, you know, Holocaust survivors. Um, and it was, it was extremely controversial. Yeah. They, they lost a bunch of members. They almost died as an organization, but they, they kind of became famous for it. And, you know, the liberal press kind of applauded them because of this, of this abstract universal vision of freedom of speech. And, and it's become their kind of like fundraising, uh you know like a kind of like beacon they they point to now like if you google aclu skokie there's like articles written by the aclu about how they made the hard decision to defend freedom of speech for these terrible people and why that's a good thing right. so it just goes to show how much has changed and like kind of what we think of as as freedom of speech didn't really exist in the our current definition of it until until then yeah and it's gotten to a point where the aclu uh, because of a, I think, Supreme Court decision, they decided money is free speech. So they don't try to, you know, buck that problem in American democracy. So, and this is the reason when, when I was like more of a social Democrat, I didn't join the ACLU because they, they think money is speech, which is absurd and totally goes back to what you're saying about, you know, just sort of removing any sort of material analysis from these sort of abstract ideals. Right, right. I mean, the ACLU was in support of, of Citizens United, which yeah, yeah, so yeah, that was that wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> it was Citizens not good. United for fat stacks. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Everybody getting some of that. So much speech. 
So just, much speech. Yeah, my just wallet bank accounts. bursting with speech. <laughs> like a rap video where the guy's just throwing speech at a woman or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, my feet feel good here. Just throwing books at a stripper. <laughs> She's like, oh, so too many ideas. Yeah. Oh, man. You need just, to process all these high level ideas. Like Thomas Paine and shit. <laughs> Check it out. Um, <laughs> so. This turn paves the way for, in the 80s, the first sort of wave of uh, people that are mysteriously taking advantage of this new thing where you can you can uh, go to court on the basis of, or you, you can go, you can defend really insidious, devious, far-right shit on the basis of free speech. Because right. the, the Skokie Nazis actually like learned from the ACLU that it was a uh that it was a good idea to rebrand as like free speech events at least even when you're going to like set up something like that and you see this throughout the history of far right organizing like um I can't remember which Nazis it was uh in the book I can't remember if it was the Charlottesville guys or whatever but you see like people you know set up a march and it says like the march against Jews or something and then like another poster goes up a week later where they paint over it they go, oh, march for free speech uh we figured out that we're not going to get in trouble if it's framed as uh you know this this uh, thing that everyone likes right um and good yeah I mean and I think even scarier than the Nazis was the kind of like far right the money in far right, like the Koch brothers really latched onto this idea of free speech. So like uh, Richard Fink, who is the policy advisor for the Koch brothers back in the seventies and eighties, um, basically outlined this entire strategy to overtake all of America's institutions with, with far right ideas. Um, and can, am I allowed to read a, a quote of his? Yeah, please. Uh, um, so he wrote in, about his strategy. At the higher stages, we have the investment in the intellectual raw materials. That is the exploration and production of abstract concepts and theories. In public policy arena, these still come primarily uh, from research done by scholars at universities. To have consequences, ideas need to be transformed into more practical or usable form. So in the middle stages, they're applied to relevant context and molded into needed solutions for real world problems. This is the work of think tanks and policy institutions. And then at the bottom stages, we have citizen activists or implementation groups are needed uh, to take policy ideas from think tanks and translate them to proposals that citizens can understand and act upon. So basically what he was doing back in the 70s was creating this entire model where you fund universities, uh, professorships, um, books, all, all of these kinds of things. Some of our most famous like anti-PC culture books, Dinesh D'Souza, all of those people come, Charles Murray, come from being funded by this uh, 1970s, 1980s system where conservatives poured money into these intellectuals, quote unquote intellectuals, um, and uh, then those intellectuals would influence universities. People would buy up school and college programs, right? And then they would they would put out theories like you know Frederick Hayek's like version of economics that you know you can't have freedom without economic freedom for corporations, right? So that was like couched in a free speech uh, argument. And then that trickles down to the think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and whatever. And then you get to today where you have like, you know, college campus groups who are saying like you're oppressing conservatives. This was all planned out. This was all mapped out. This was all funded by like five people, including the DeVos family and the Koch brothers. So to me, that's even scarier than the Nazis because the entire structure, the entire framing of how we think of freedom is based in like five people's devious plan from the 1970s to convince us all that billionaires should get everything they want or else we're suppressing freedom. Yeah. A couple of things about that. <clears throat> the first thing is, um, you know, reading your book and also reading uh, Dark Money by Jane Meyer, Mayer, I can't remember which one. Mayer. There you go, Mayer. Um, anytime you read about the Koch brothers, you know, it's, it's overwhelming the amount of tiny think tanks and shell companies i literally cannot remember the names of all of them because it's, a, it's they refer to it as the coctopus it's just this insane web of groups of these innocuous names like the policy institute or the freedom whatever um anytime 
there's a a story or a suspect thing. I mean, you, this is something you probably take with you. Just look look up who sponsored the damn story. Whenever you're reading something that you have a little bit of a suspicion about, it's usually a, an institution that is a, a cover for literally a thing that goes back to this handful of people. And so that's you know that's really alarming um, because you do notice that they you know in the 80s of this first wave they set up these Dinesh D'Souza's and people like that and they also funded the the Charlie Kirks and people like that that we have today literally all of them all connected to the DeVos family and the Cokes and stuff like that um but as a comic you know what's more what's really disturbing to me about this is that I want to go do a fucking open mic or something or hang out on a forum where I you know book shows or something like that everybody I know is infected with this ideology and I don't think every dickhead at a bar comedy show who's you know is clearly just some weirdo hanging around pursuing a dream for no reason is literally funded by the Koch brothers I think what happened is that the ideology escaped the original you know institutions and the intended purpose was achieved which was to infect people right. <clears throat> with a worldview um and right. it's and it- it's so pervasive. I mean, something like 350 college programs were directly funded through this this like freedom initiative in the 70s and 80s, right? And they still exist today. Like entire university programs that give us our very definition of freedom are are funded by these you know very few people. So yeah, I mean, it, you can't blame people who. It's just in the ether. It's like if you you know like do you believe in freedom? Oh sure, I believe in freedom. And then it's like so what's your definition of freedom? It's handed down to you by these people. Right. And it's it's moved away from this sort of liberal idealist view of free speech, which is uh, the government allowing people to say whatever they want and not jailing them, which, which is obviously has a lot of you know holes in that, too. But it, it's moved even away from that to like just any sort of disc- discourse or whatever. Everyone immediately has to be taken seriously by non-state actors to the point where, like, I remember – when I was uh, in high school in the 2000s, there was uh, a day of silence thing for, you know, GLBT youth, they're called at the time, who were, were in the closet. And I remember some like conservative Christian kids saying, hey, what happened to freedom of speech? Like the, f- the fact that we're not going to people aren't going to debate you is is like an infringement on free speech that's that's okay. moved away from whatever the, you know, the sort of constitutional definition was. Yeah, um, the propaganda is very effective. Um, I I know this because I you know I it, one point in my career as a comic really caught the anti woke bug myself, and only later on sort of came to understand that I think what it really is being sold to people with uh, with this thing where you go, ah, it's freaking you know academic people are out of control is. An emotional explanation, you know, it's, it's something to relieve your anxiety with a scapegoat, which, you know, you see all throughout history. I mean, you want to take control of people, tell them that the the thing that is ruining their life is embodied in a group of people, not in, uh, you know, in the fucking fact that the Koch brothers and all this shit have all the money, right? Um, and so that, you know, that that's really pervasive on. Uh, yeah. So another aspect of this is uh, and you talk about this in your book is um well let's look at these sort of situations on these campuses where people are crying you know uh censorship because charles murray can't speak or whatever like this is somehow violating this concept of censorship that stands in stark contrast with uh things throughout history like COINTELPRO or more modernly like the j20 arrests and things like that um imagine you know let's compare those things next to each other because that's something also that chomsky did at one point uh where he made a great point about um COINTELPRO versus i can't remember which other thing but um you know you you see sort of with the material analysis i guess uh i don't know can you speak to that a little bit i'm kind of losing my thread here well, yeah, I mean, I think the place to start is that there is there is no free speech ever. There never will be. There's no such thing as completely free speech, right? You're always limiting speech in some way. If you're at a college campus, you know, is getting in, is not getting into your preferred college a form of suppression of free speech? No. Like, is getting a bad grade a form of suppression of free speech? Everything operates on the suppression of speech, period. It, you know, if I if I go on this podcast and start talking about I don't know, like dogs and kittens, and you keep asking me questions about free speech, but I only talk about dogs and kittens. Like, (laughs) 
you're, you're not going to have me on the podcast again. Is that a suppression of my free speech? No, but the podcast only works because you limit people's free speech, right? So I'm going to have you on my other so, podcast, actually. It's about <laughs> dogs and kids, show. baby. Might better not talk about politics on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but so the idea that we we have to defend free speech is like a lie on its face because we've never had free speech and we never will. That's not how the world works. Um, so what when you look at like, for example, these college campus battles, they're not battles over free speech. They're battles over racism and capitalism and everything else. You know, they're battles over, should we have this fascist speaking on our college campus? No, because we hate fascism, not because we hate free speech, right? Um, because the free, the free speech already didn't exist. Students can't do whatever they want and neither can speakers. You know, colleges don't invite people who advocate for the blowing up of whatever government or whatever, like, no college would do that, right? So, um, right. The so call, call think, the argument about colleges presupposes that colleges allow anyone who just comes to the college right, because exactly. I want to speak here to speak, and then we go in and we stop selectively some of those. But you already curate your own fucking schedule of who gets to speech speak. So inherently. That it, like you already restrict things, and that's how everything yeah. works. Especially because you're a fucking private institution, you know. I, I came up with something while I was reading this, and I think I might have a, a clever gotcha, but I, these things never work in practice because no one gives a shit if they're a hypocrite. <laughs> but I was thinking about this, and I was, um, you know, I was thinking about how like everyone always sorts of go sort of goes with the, your Charles Murrays and your Myelianopolises and people like that. Like you know, uh, well, you know, it's it's. It's it's healthy for your mind to listen to people you disagree with. So, you know, you may be right, he may be right, but you should listen to them uh, or they should be allowed to speak because that's like sacred to this ecosystem of ideas that we have or whatever. And I was thinking about that and I was like, you know what I bet no one would do this with is if you were at a college and you were like, I've got this guy, he's a pro pedophilia activist and he's going to come and talk <laughs> about pedophilia because – if once you get into like um, pedophilia, the, everyone has a line. Like most people, then go, "Well, no, no, no." Like you know, that's crazy, right? And you go, "Well, why is that crazy?" And the Nazi one isn't. Well, it's because you kind of actually believe what the Nazi guy is saying to some level. Exactly. Everyone exactly. Well, has a fucking line where credit. I mean, credit where it's due. I think Ginsburg kind of comes out sort of is in sort of the uh, middle ground between these two free speech movements. And he, by the like 70s or 80s or something, was uh, <laughs> speaking on behalf of Nambla. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, mean, I, I guess people do the exception, though. People do take it to that degree. But I think that it, it at least heightens the contradiction a little bit. It puts it in contrast. And you go, I mean, you know, is there value at all in um, in 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 purposely helping someone within the capitalist system to promote an idea and also would do you think this might lead to something bad happening and i think with uh with like anti-fascism people really have a hard time understanding the idea that what you're preventing is speech that might cause something bad to happen but if you're but if, if you if you go well how about a pedophile then i think people were able to make that leap immediately and go yeah you probably shouldn't have someone going around telling people this is okay again People, this doesn't work on the internet. Don't try to own someone with their own logic. But I, uh, but I, but I think that maybe thinking about it that way does really put into um, more material terms the idea that like words are somewhat insightful. You know, right? And and we should remember too, like the purpose of a lot of this stuff is to launder ideas that, for good reason, have. Uh, gone out of fashion that is race science is one this right. is exactly charles murray right this is the whole mission behind in, including him in this is he wrote a book the bell curve which is just fascist propaganda it was just he, he literally used like american nazi newspapers as research for this book and he was able to say you have to listen to me because of free speech yeah right. does you know like and you have to debate me you have to uh, legitimate this this argument yeah i mean and i think like the middlebury which is the, you know the small liberal arts college with which this all happened at with charles murray like the students there aren't stupid they weren't just like no i don't want to hear ideas that offend me they like wrote like a ten thousand word thesis on free speech that like grappled with all of these questions they were very nuanced about it um and you know but the the best kind of explanation i heard was this is a school 
And if we were in bi a biology department, would you bring in someone that's like, I don't believe in biology, right? Or if you were in the environmentalism department, would you bring in someone that's like global warming is fake? No, because the way a school runs is to build on knowledge that people agree is true and then move on, right, to other knowledge. And so when it comes to race and, uh, you know, the things Charles, Mur Charles Murray is saying, it's not that people care about free speech. It's that, the, as Jake was saying, like, a lot of people actually kind of believe him that black people are more stupid than white people and uh, deserve a, a less good life because of that, right? So if you don't believe in that, there's no reason to hear this guy speak in the same way there's no reason to hear a, a biology denier speak. But uh, but the the like the real reason is is because a lot of people actually agree with him. Charles Murray wrote that book on man boy love, the ball curve. <laughs> Ooh. Um, I think laundering is a good way to put it. The, you know, far right conservatives tend to launder their less um, palatable views through the guise of free speech the same way that like neoliberal conservative ish types launder everything through like identity and stuff like that. You really can't trust someone who won't just come out and say what they're trying to say because it's not actually popular. Right. Um, so, I mean, we could sort of get into a wormhole talking about the campus thing all day, but I think that pretty much lays out uh, what's going on there. Um, I guess I wanted to kind of round out by talking about the internet because there's um, there's a new facet to this argument that I think makes things a little bit more confusing and a little bit murkier, and um, it has to do with technology sort of connection to the state at this point. So I bring this up all the time when I'm arguing with people about this, but, um, you know, free speech, even if you want to look at it really as an idealistic concept, it only applies to like when the state censors you, uh, comedians all the time will complain, Oh, they're being censored because they got fired from a TV show or something, or they lost their book deal or the audience just doesn't like them, you know? And, uh, those don't even make sense in an idealistic, uh, framework because that's the private market. Um, the private market is in, by your own definition allowed to act however it wants, but what we're sort of referring to in these ACLU cases and stuff like that is with the state censoring your speech. So right. comedians who today are sort of whining that they're bombing often compare themselves to someone like Lenny Bruce who actually did come into conflict with the state in what you really could refer to as an, at least an individual civil liberties sort of case of free speech being censored. Um, and so that distinction, I think – in a lot of cases does help to clear out when someone is just contradicting themselves by going, well, I should be allowed to sell my fucking comedy special. That's called, you know, triggered or whatever. Um, but <laughs> that distinction is blurred as we get into the internet because we're now living in a, a situation where the internet is run by a few mega corporations who work hand in hand with the law uh, and with the state. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, we, we kind of can look at being censored, uh, being kicked off of something like Twitter, you know, maybe on some level as being, um, not quite the same thing as being kicked off of a private platform because this is like a thing that like maybe should be on its way to becoming a public platform or something like that. I'm not really sure. I was kind of curious. You're, your thoughts on all this. Um, and b before we even get into that, I kind of want to just go through some things that I thought were interesting that you laid out in your book in how we got here with the internet. So the internet, like everything in history, came from anti-communism, right? DARPA was a, uh, a, a program to uh, categorize and make, you know, a massive like proto search engine uh, organization tool for recognizing communists. Um, and <laughs> they went as far during the Vietnam War to lay around like uh, microphones and urine detectors all over Vietnam <laughs> because uh, they were trying to compile a database that would allow them to sort of guess and pick where to bomb in the Vietnam War, which I thought was really funny. I also thought it was really funny that, uh, that the Vietnamese like 
got around this by just throwing bags of piss everywhere <laughs> and like speakers and stuff like that. Very cool, you know, funny thing from history. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, throughout the history of the internet, you see it go from this, uh, you know, this military tool to privatization. But every once in a while, you sort of still catch the government using it for these uh, these like Project Camelots and stuff like that. Right. Um, it also and, has this heavy libertarian bench. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Yasha Yasha Levine's um, Surveillance Valley is a, a great book on this. But you know, if we're going to start a, a conversation about free speech on the internet, we have to start with the fact that it, the internet was never meant for free speech in the first place. It was a surveillance tool from the U.S. government. And another thing lost to history is that there were big protests at you know MIT, at UC Berkeley, at all these places where the internet was essentially being invented huge protests with people being like, uh, I don't think this is a good idea to have this massive surveillance network that's like controlled by the government. Um, and now that's completely lost to history. And then there was a very purposeful, uh, when the internet was privatized, a very purposeful like propaganda campaign where the keys were kind of handed over to these humongous corporations. Um, and then magazines like Wired came out, which were all funded by these like internet privatizers who who made a very you know purposeful attempt to rebrand it from a surveillance tool into a tool for free speech and for free expression, right? So again, the idea that we have of the internet that it was ever a place of free expression is completely false and just based on on propaganda. Um, that being said, I mean it's how we communicate now, right? And so there are legitimate concerns about if Zoom can kick off. You know, there have been like pro-Palestinian lecture, lecturers kicked off of Zoom. Um, if Twitter can kick anyone off, whether on the right or left, um, that that is a big deal because these corporations have be, have become synonymous with our public spaces, right? So even though they are private corporations, because they have such monopoly power, it, it is very scary that they can do whatever the hell they want. The solution to that is not to say that Twitter should allow everything on their platform because no one should be forced, no company, whatever, should be forced to, you know, platform Nazis or whatever. But that we need to, like, you know, break up the Internet. We need to uh, not allow these uh, corporations to have so much power in the first place. So in one sense, like, when I see... Donald Trump being kicked off Twitter. I'm like, you know, good riddance, bye. But I also do understand the concern because if it's up to such so few people who gets to speak and who doesn't, that that's not a good situation. So it's it's not an issue of the First Amendment because they're all they're all private corporations. But it is it is something to be worried about. But again, as as a communist, like my solution is to, you know, break up these companies and and remove a lot of the profit motive of the internet rather than just say everyone has a right to speak which will never exist anyway because it never does so. rather than to reprogram twitter right to be a new even better twitter <laughs> <laughs> as the apex of your politics which i think is where a lot of people are at right now um yeah i mean you talk about how the the internet as we know it isn't uh it isn't really a level uh, what do you call it objective sort of thing anyway because it has like you know algorithms that sort things in the in the uh in the per in the what do you call it in the purpose of like profit so like if you google something uh example you use in the book is if you google chiquita google doesn't tell you about the banana republics and the origins of the chiquita company it tells you about where to buy chiquita bananas and stuff like that so even just by even not even insidiously, you know, just by design, uh, the way we function, the internet is inherently like a biased thing. And, uh, also just comes from like crazy. Yeah. Like you were saying like libertarians. One thing I thought was really funny in your book was this guy, Stuart Brand, the, uh, cybernetics guy and how like a lot of the early pioneers of the internet were, you know, involved in this like commune where they tested out a lot of this stuff and imagined that, the technology would open people's freedom to be part of this grand cybernetic theory that we're all part of one giant machine and it ends up just devolving into like proto Twitter where people are just like bullying each other and stuff like that. Um, pretty bizarre stuff. Um, 
I guess let me pause for a second. Okay, yeah. So a lot of this is, um, yeah, a lot of this comes into question when uh, Sesta Fosta comes out, which we've talked about on the show, which was uh, a law designed to, you know, essentially just deplatform sex workers and keep them from being able to, you know, perform their own work. Um, but it it moved things around where previously a platform could not be uh, prosecuted, or if that's the word, uh, charged for um, the for what someone on the platform says. So, like, if I put something, you know, fucking uh, whatever, lewd or indecent on Twitter, Twitter doesn't get in trouble, I get in trouble. But they switched it around with Sesta Fossa, which is really interesting, where uh, now we have... I don't know. I what the, where the where the fuck is this going? Do you think the Sesta Fosta thing? It's going to get worse and worse. I mean, the government is just like, well, one, the government hates sex workers, obviously, but two, like, it it becomes this other thing where you know, like, the same people who are mad about Trump being deplatformed or whatever, or you know, being shadow banned or whatever, would never care about the fact that like you know, half my friends can't post anything on Instagram and run their business with, without the fear of Instagram banning them or reporting them to law enforcement or whatever, right? So I think the internet's going to become more and more surveilled. I don't think, I think we're worrying in all the wrong places. Like, it's not, it's not just about liberal versus conservative or leftist being kicked off of Twitter or whatever. It's like the internet is just becoming a surveillance technology to arrest people people who the government doesn't like and i think that's just going to become more and more true as the years go on so like they're going to keep passing laws about like what you can and can't say online people are already getting arrested for posting you know like even if they're like joke you know threats to someone in power they get arrested or you know people getting arrested for like saying like oh i want to like kill my ex-wife because she's such a bitch or whatever like people are sitting in jail for 10 years for posting that on Facebook. Right. So um, it, it's not a place of freedom. I don't think it ever will be. I think we're just going to see it become more and more surveilled and more and more policed in the future. Yeah. I guess with all like the fake facial recognition uh, technology and the scary Cambridge Analytica stuff and Facebook kind of, you know, listening to you and watching you all the time, um, that really calls into question this idea that it's this universal tool for free speech and that somehow rich celebrity or whatever losing their Twitter account is, uh, you know, anything to compare to just the, the systemic nature of the thing in terms of, uh, you know, censoring and deplatforming people like in a leftward direction. Um, right. yeah, I guess when, when Trump got kicked off Twitter, I just couldn't help thinking about like, uh, you know, the people that are calling this Orwellian have never met like a sex worker or a fucking, <laughs> you know, communist or something like that. Who's like, I'm on my 10th Twitter account, you know, cause this happens every fucking week or whatever. Yeah. Uh, this is something to be understood about reality. Not something that like, <laughs> that I've uh, am under any delusions is, is a, a space that I'm just freely allowed to work in or whatever. Um, right. And I, I think it's also just like, it, like, Every like I think prison is the largest, uh, you know, detriment to free speech in the world. Right? There are millions of people who like literally do not have the right to speak because they're in prison. Like, if you care about free speech, care about shit like that, care about like abolition. Like, it, in a way, I think all of these arg arguments about free speech are just a, a distraction from the fact that like tens of millions of people don't have any freedom in this country and are are uh, not like, you know, much less speaking on Twitter, they're like not able to survive in this fucking country. So in a way, at the end of the day, I'm just like sick of all these conversations, not this conversation, obviously, but like <laughs> other ones, <laughs> these conversations on Twitter and all this back and forth. Cause it's like, you've completely removed from reality. What is going on? Everyone is just arguing these like esoteric, values when like people are fucking dying <laughs> so like sure care about freedom of speech but like have have a sense of scale of who's actually being oppressed or victimized here by the government yeah 
I mean, I guess to put a button on this whole thing, the other thing I've been thinking about a lot is uh, the passages law, Prop 22. And, you know, we're already seeing some of the effects of it in that companies like Instacart are uh, breaking up unions and stuff like that, firing employees for trying to organize um, and, you know, forcing, as we've talked about on the show a lot, uh, workers into just these precarious situations where they're technically – what do you call it? Uh, independent contractors, not employees. So now nobody has fucking health insurance and all this stuff. Um, and this is all a byproduct, I think, of that material stuff I was talking about at the beginning of the show, where there's no frontier, there's nowhere else to expand in order to keep maintaining profit or at least uh, rising profit. So, you know, what we're experiencing right now is this precarity. And uh, things are only going to get worse and worse because we passed that. I keep saying we like I did this shit. Uh, America passed that fucking law. You know, they passed uh, Prop 22. People connected to it are in the Biden administration. Biden's up screaming about how much he loves Republicans. All this stuff is going to get worse and worse and worse from a material perspective. And so while this is happening, um, to be understanding that to, to not understand, I guess, that you're your freedom of speech is actually shrinking for these reasons and to be instead letting other people frame it like it's uh you know like it's being attacked by uh kids on college campuses or woke comedians or whatever is uh it's a distraction you know it's it will never lead anywhere we're seeing this already like repeat itself as a cycle every decade or so with the you know, the Coke funded PC scare, woke scare. They just changed the name of it from PC to woke or whatever. Um, yeah, I think it's important for people to have this materialist understanding of uh, positivist. I threw an extra T in there. Positivist <laughs> liberty. So you should read P.E.'s book. Causivist. <laughs> um, is there anything else anyone want to get to before we get out of here? I've been looking into Nambla for the last half hour <laughs> since Xander's brought it up. And did you know one of the co-founders is a uh, like militant Trotskyist oh, from the seventies and out. he's used his Marxism <laughs> and, and, and he's shaped it into the tool of pro pedophile activism. And, uh, his name's David Thorstad. Definitely an interesting Wikipedia read. I recommend it to everyone on the podcast. <laughs> Um, never mind. Yeah. Maybe they were right about the cultural Marxism. Well, according to <laughs> according to Allen Ginsberg, it, it wasn't about pedophilia; it was about free speech. <laughs> what he said. Oh, no, to so. this guy, it was about the pedophilia. Though. Okay. he was pretty clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. said there's one really good quote here, and then I will not talk about it anymore. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> he said, uh, "Pederasts in America are the same as Jews in Nazi Germany." Wow. Uh, <laughs> yikes. Um, Reading I mean, can be dangerous. At some point. <laughs> there should be more censorship. <laughs> All right. Well, P, thank you so much for joining us. I am a huge fan of your work and I enjoy reading your books. Uh, sorry, we didn't do this when the book came out. I know that usually helps book sales and stuff like that, but I, I enjoy this book and I recommend it to people a lot because I'm a comedian. So I get into free speech fights all the time and I always go. There's a book that's, you know, it's good reading. It lays out this uh, this misframing of the argument pretty well, which is, right. you know, this shit doesn't exist, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, where can my listeners uh, read more of your stuff? Uh, I guess just go to my Twitter. If you just Google P.E. Moskowitz, you'll find everything and go from there. Yeah. Cool. I'll link. In that's the hub. The show notes. Anybody that's got anything to plug? Uh, at Anders Linker on Twitter, Dursley One, Instagram, Redacted Tonight is my other job. Um, labor for single payer is something that people should be involved with, as well as uh, we should probably plug some political prisoners while we're here. You do your plugs, Alex, and I'll find something. Okay. This does go back to a separate section that isn't like personal plugs. Sure. <laughs> where we plug the prisoners. Um, 
I'm going to plug my other podcast, Pod Damn America, Ball Nut Super, Theater of Delights. You can find me on Twitter at Patak Jokes, and that's it for me. Freemumia.com. Yeah, look into Mumia. Mumia is still not free. Wow. He's still not free. Biden hasn't pardoned him yet. Little known band Rage Against the Machine. They put out some good stuff. Look at that. (laughs) Yeah. Um,. If you're in Austin, there's this uh, really horrible organization called Save Austin Now that I was reading about last night that is uh, trying to sort of enact like NIMBY San Francisco sort of anti-homelessness laws. They're trying to criminalize homelessnesses. Homelessnesses. I can't talk today. Uh, so if Positivism. you're one of my <laughs> listeners in Austin, go tell those people to get fucked for me. Um, <laughs> merch. We have new t-shirts and stickers and stuff like that. The stickers are huge, and I used union labor to make them, so that's why they're $3. Uh, blah, 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 but the, the, the shirts and the stickers are cool, so check those out. And my other podcast is Why You Mad. And I think that's it. I think meeting is adjourned. Thank cool. you again for joining us, P.E. Thanks uh, for having me. It's... Uh, finished finished it's finished all right